What's going on? Wow. I just hit puberty. That was fun. That was good stuff. <laughs> oh, good intro. You know, you always love a real good, clean, professional introduction. Uh, what's up, everybody? This is JP. We're at the session here, hanging out with Chad from Gray Wolf Brewing. Hope everything's going good on your guys' end out there in podcast world, listening to this show and uh, enjoying beers and drinking about beers now that, uh, you know, you're drinking about beers just said and that's weird um you know things are opening up a little bit more and hopefully you guys are getting out there and supporting each other supporting your local breweries your craft breweries and uh you know just sort of doing all the shopping that was really hard to do (laughs) over the last year and and change whatever the months are i don't even know anymore uh you know so hopefully like that i was able to actually get out finally and uh and take my kid uh, go to a park and that was fun it was a good time and uh there were lots of people around and I felt really uncomfortable. And then I was like, you know what? This is the catalyst I needed. Cause before people were like, Oh, let's go to this bar and sit outside. I'm like, no, I'm afraid of the air. And, uh, you know, but now being, it was children's fairyland in Oakland. If anybody's ever heard of that. It's like, it's like Disneyland. If it had like, like a twin removed in birth, like after at birth or something. And then the twin, um, you know, I don't know, watch cartoons 24 seven, just like, just like small, weird, um, very odd park. Um, uh, but cool. And like sort of vibey and very Oakland. Um, I liked it. I, you know, basically if you lived in the Bay area, you sort of went here as a kid <laughs> and it was cool to like take my kid there and hang out with some family there. And it was a good time. Um, everyone was wearing masks and it was, uh, you know, it was fun. But, uh, anyway, uh, after that, I feel like I'm ready now to like go sit outside at, at a you know with a, a at a bar and get a beer and start supporting my uh, my community. And anyway, hopefully you guys are doing the same. Um, hmm. You should probably get some sun too. You look a little pale. Uh, well, it's the light, man. It's my makeup tutorial light. See, so I'll turn it off. You know. yeah. But it yeah. helps, right? Anyway, well, we're here with Chad from Gray Wolf Brewing. Chad, what's going on, dude? Welcome to the show. It is Monday, time for beer. Been working all day long. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh-huh. Uh, one little thing about Grey Wolf here is uh, I truly am everything about the the company, the business, the brewing, the the whole shebang. Uh, so um, I work about six days a week. Um, yeah, insane amount of uh, hours put in. You know, uh, when you open five weeks before COVID shuts everything down. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do, man. Wow. Five weeks before. Yeah. Jiminy yep. Christmas. Yep. How was it? Yep. How, how were those five weeks leading up to it? Were, were they like everything you expected or? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were touching upon uh, projected numbers. I mean, it, okay. it's kind of hard to really gauge what that's actually going to be. You're in a new place. You're, uh, uh, well, running a business, something you've never done before. So you just, you know, throw your hat in the ring, say, hey, let's go. Yeah, and then the rug gets absolutely yanked out from underneath you. Uh, I, uh, yeah, the uh, here in California, as you know, the uh, I, actually, I don't know, uh, were you open on March sixteenth that final day, or was everything shut down back oh, in twenty twenty when the, the bar? I have no idea. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, it was actually literally five weeks that I'd been open and uh, this whole thing comes down. We have our final night. I uh, wrap up, send the last customers out the door, close up everything and just start, you know, walking around, cleaning up, doing my, my normal evening chores afterwards and just kind of look around and think, you have absolutely got to be shitting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you like? What do you do? Like, what do you think I, about? Like, are you just like, uh, are you thinking you're going to survive? I mean, because we didn't know. Nobody knew how long this is going to be. Nobody I had a clue. A lot of brewers were like, I thought maybe a couple of weeks at the most, but it turns out it wasn't that at all. Yeah, no, it turned out closer to what, four, 15 months now, is it, I think, kind of where we're at at this moment. Um, the nice thing for us is um, definitely planned flexibility into the, the business model. And uh, I had actually purchased an October uh, can seamer uh some months before at an auction turns out it was a really good purchase because i have absolutely milked every single cent out of that thing <laughs> there you go uh yeah uh i don't know something like 26 27 000 cans in the past year 
filled individually. So damn that uh, that saved our ass because we wouldn't have been able to make it without that at all. Uh, we uh, we shut down that Saturday, as I was alluding to uh, Sunday. Uh, the promise I made to my wife on this whole thing was that yeah. Sundays were for her and for the boys. I've got uh, a three and a four year old. Nice. And um, so uh, shut down that Saturday night, went home, tried as hard as I could not to think about potential <laughs> catastrophe of the future. Right. Just try to clear my mind, came in Monday morning with uh, the focus that got me to that point and said, okay, let's find a solution. Let's make this thing work. And uh, we have a local supplier here that offers uh, bright cans, empties. And I uh, drove over 10 minutes later, had a pallet of cans, started filling and was open the next day for to go sales and did that for the past year, pretty much. So you're, you're in California, you're in Norco, which is yep. Southern California, like near Riverside, I think, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're okay. kind of at the crux. If, uh, if anybody's familiar with the area at all, it's the Interstate 15 and the uh, State Highway 91, which we uh, all lovingly around here refer to as the 91. No, of course, you got to. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> That's a big thing, man. It's the only way to get from Riverside into Orange County, and it just sucks. Always. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, more beer have a shop down Riverside and it was like, uh, you know, driving down there and hanging around later for a little bit You're like, ah, oh, this is awful. I know a few people out in Riverside like this is just the worst. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, and, and on that note, I got to give a shout out to Rob over there at more beer. The oh, dude there you go. Awesome. I yeah. uh, he's taken care of me over the past. I don't know. Probably seven years or so that uh, from home brewing on into now, um, if in a pinch, he, I need something here at the brewery. I call him up and he takes care of me. Nice. That's cool. Good old yeah. Rob. He, big uh, penny stock trader guy. Or at least he was. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. He, like like do one of the yeah penny stocks and shit. <laughs> Just farting yeah. around. It was like, all right, cool. Hopefully you made a lot of money, man. That's so I bet he's a big crypto guy now. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's something I'm actually getting into here now is the uh, the whole crypto world. Me too. Let me uh, tell you. Uh huh. Um, yep. You know, I just I I just sold off my V chain. Okay. And um, I, uh, I got into, uh, well, I don't know if I should say, because it's one of those you want to keep close to the chest, uh, track. Hmm. Can't say I'm actually familiar with that one, but. It's like, for me, it's like, I mean, look, my friend Evan got me into it and he's like, okay, now I'm selling this. He's basically just my daddy. He's like, okay, I'm going to get out of VeChain. I'm going to move into this. And I think you should do that too. I'm like, he goes, but I'm not, but I'm not your advisor. I'm not your investment advisor. I'm like, you kind of are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that it, and uh, drunkenly, I'm like, that sounds like a good idea. And then, you know, you make money on it. So I'm like, oh, look, I'll just do whatever you tell me to do, Evan. I don't really give a shit, but it's like, it's like coins on the blockchain rather than just crypto. And it's a whole thing. I don't know. Anyway. Um, sure. Yep. So you're in California, yep. um, but I didn't think we were allowed to like places were allowed to open. Did you just say like, fuck it, I'm going to sell cans and no one can stop me? Uh, Are you one of those guys, Chad? Uh, well, not entirely. Uh, okay. To to some extent, uh, there was a little bit. It was it was definitely a, a decision that was made that um, all of the factors combined. I really didn't qualify for any of the stimulus money for a bit small business. Uh, I Why not? opened. I had all of my startup costs in 2019. And many of the calculations for what you would get as a business were the delta from 2019 to 2020. Well, on the on paper, I actually was profitable in 2020. So that's a positive delta, not a negative one. So basically, they said, no, okay. sorry, nothing for you. Wow. Cool, dude. <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, right? Yeah, I've busted my ass. I've spent a year away from my family working 18 hour days and this. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah that feels sweet. good, man. Yeah. Oh, so next round, how about PPP? Oh, wait, I do everything here. I don't have employees, no payroll. Again, shafted. So, <laughs> I couldn't get PPP either um, because I'm, a, I'm like a general contractor. Okay, yeah. Employed, but I need a business bank account. Okay. And I didn't have one because it just, I had an LLC for all my podcasts. And I was like, well, I got rid of it because my tax, I was like, you don't need it. And this comes, it's like, well, Turns out you should have kept it. Yeah, it turns out I should have kept it because then I would have gotten some relief. But, you know, yeah. I yeah. did. Uh, so uh, came out of it. on the, the back end of all of this, I will say I actually did get a little bit of, of relief, uh, what they're calling a sole proprietor compensation. Oh, OK. For individuals such as myself. I think there's probably, I don't know, 10,000, 20, 30,000 
uh, individuals such as myself that started businesses at the beginning of 2020 and mm -hmm. are in the exact same situation where they they work themselves to the bone and have actually gotten shafted. So they need uh, help. all you things know, I... considered, uh, it's right, right. And uh, really, I'd say the small business and, and just a, another little stat, because that's just one of the, the way my mind works on stats and things like that. Uh, three, uh, what, 34 percent of all small businesses have closed since January of 2020. One third of all business, small businesses in the United States have closed permanently that's frightening as hell yeah uh, but yeah, hey we, we needed way more help than we got that's for sure yeah yeah and and you know um uh, through all of this uh i uh, i don't know if you were down there in, in long beach in 2019 for the craft brewers conference in down there uh, no i was not i don't i don't get to go to the, the cbc anymore really so with this one um I sat in on a uh, back in 2019. I was just uh, still in the the, the um, planning phases, if you will, or well, not even planning, but but getting open phases. And um, I sat in on a, uh, a little panel with uh, Tommy Arthur, Doug Constantine, or Chris Kramer, and one or two others, like some Doug pretty you. healthy names on uh, yeah. you know what what you need to know and and a Q and A sort of thing for uh, for opening small businesses. And uh, I think it was Tommy Arthur that said, you know what, at the end of the day, no matter what happens, because it will suck, uh, there will be those days, we have beer. And True. that has been a saving grace for me <laughs> over the past year, because I either just cry into my beer or otherwise homebrew, I guess it would have been otherwise. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's all, that's sort of dual advice, right? Because it's, it's your, your, per, at the end of the day, you have beer to drink to like help you recover and help you figure it out and whatever, which is, right. you know, uh, I don't know how, how healthy that is, but <laughs> right. on the other side is you have beer. So people are going to come to you for the same exact reason. So there is sort of that uh, what do they call the the the, the sin um, the, the 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 vice um, industries like tobacco and liquor and you know and and beer like those are the vices that never really go away sure and, right. and then, uh, you know inflation or whatever so uh, or depression so uh, yeah I mean <laughs> it's sort of right reason. in both ways yeah but well, it's all the same <laughs> inflation depression, it doesn't matter it's you know it's sure. all the same it's all the uns. You know, and, and yeah. honestly, the blessing has been the community around here. Uh, a lot of people look at Norco or see the name Norco and they think, where the hell is that? Um, Me. They, they, yeah, right. Yeah, you, you're one of them. I've lived in uh, California my entire life. I have no idea where it was. I thought it was Nor like north somewhere. Norco is, uh, they have uh, trademarked the name Horsetown, USA. Uh, there are more right. horse trails in this town than there are actual roads or sidewalks. And wow. uh, yeah, it's giant horse community. Uh, larger properties and as it turns out quite a uh, little niche of craft beer lovers uh, there had been a brewery in this location before uh, they moved to uh, to nashville tennessee uh, which just turned out beautifully because i had been looking for a place in which to uh, to plant my seed and, uh, and grow my business yeah so uh yeah even my father uh, had uh, asked me why norco <laughs> well, like, why, why exactly that place? Like it's, yeah. it seems so backwards. And the way I describe it to most people is, is this town is literally um, small town USA in the middle of metropolis, Southern California. Yeah. You, you don't think of Southern California as having one horse trail. <laughs> well, uh, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, with 40 million people, we probably, uh, max out just about all the statistics uh, yeah, right. <laughs> every every category yeah uh, so uh so yeah we um we we found this place got started as it was a brewery before a lot of the uh the trouble with uh getting things started uh, the the troubles and and the other brewery owners out there can i'm sure can relate where you're when you're looking for a spot and you're, you're talking to a landlord and the landlord looks at you and says hey i don't want a bar in my my uh in my building, uh, the other tenants aren't going to want your kind of customers. It's like, well, actually, you know, the craft beer customer is actually a bit more savvy. And those are actually the people that you probably want seeing your other tenants businesses and it will bring more business and it yeah. brings the community together and, and all this stuff. So, yeah, it's not like you're putting in like a, a dive bar or some yeah. just like slummy sort of like where, hey, everyone, you know, let's just do dollar shots at six in the morning or you know what i mean it's not like dollar pictures and yeah, <laughs> yeah right no ride the mechanical bull yeah yeah 
Yeah, I, uh, I just saw what uh, Roadhouse, I think, just had an anniversary here recently, and that's the sort of thing that I think a lot of uh, landlords seem to think of uh, okay, when yeah. it comes to this. And I, yeah, shit like we're, that. we're definitely not that, no. So how do you so. convince them? How do you convince a space to, to move in, to let you move in? Uh, well, I have no idea. Uh, as I said, the uh, the the previous uh, tenant here in this spot was a brewery as well. I'll give a shout out. They were called Sons of Liberty. They're now actually rebranded as Bold Patriot out there in Nashville. Uh, oh, yeah, so um, really good guys, uh, super nice. Uh, they love their community and the community loved them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I actually, th th that was part of my consideration. It's something that I'd written into my business plan uh, to I figured I'd have to convince the landlord that I was not a bar, that uh, this was much more above board. I don't know if that's a good description or not, but no, that yeah, I think that's fine. But it, it is it is sort of like shining a light on how like we think on on this side of the fence that well, it, it, you know, craft beer is ubiquitous; it's everywhere. Like everybody knows about it. You don't have to explain it to people, but apparently there are people who still don't really get it, and they just think it's a bar everything should be equal everything should be traded just fine it, you're, you're producing beer you're probably going to have a bunch of rowdy dickheads um you know and being that close to riverside it's not wrong and uh no i'm kidding um yeah so i mean I, yeah i mean it's that's it's sort of shocking honestly indeed indeed and uh well you know um depending upon the space and how much you're you're invested in in that locale um, you may go to battle and try to, to win that fight or you just yeah. move on. And I was not really in a, in a, a state of mind to really go to battle over this, this thing. Cause, um, honestly, I, I'd been homebrewing for nine years at that point and had some award-winning beers and thought, you know, Hey, um, this thing could work, but I had never brewed commercially before. I had never brewed anything larger than a 20 gallon batch. What are you doing? Like that, that's the mentality. And, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm being a little more aggressive than I needed to be because I thought it was funny, but like, what are you, what are you doing? Because it's, you know, you're not the first person. I think you're actually the second in this month <laughs> that we've talked to with the same thing. We're like, I've been home brewing and then I made the jump to craft beer with no in between, no working at another brewery no learning the ropes or whatever what what's your background to make you to make what did you th how did you think that you could be no but like what did you what made you think that you could just jump in and, and and do it why not seek out any sort of you know foundationary you know knowledge in the beginning well for me uh I, i've uh going back to literally my first year of college i uh actually got into a uc davis on a, a football, um, I'm not going to say scholarship because they didn't actually assist me there, but that was in high school. I was, I was that guy. I was the, was a wrestler, was a football player and, and all that. Nice. And, uh, got in UC Davis. And one of the courses I took was introduction to winemaking and, and, um, was it just intro to winemaking? I think was the name of the course. Uh, apparently it's one of the more difficult courses, uh, for, for freshmen up there uh, and I excelled in the class. The, the biology, the chemistry, everything is absolutely uh, phenomenal to me. Uh, oh, I, made it th I made it through high school without doing a damn thing. Uh, oh. I, I honestly think it was a joke. Um, <laughs> had, had I applied myself, it's interesting, it would have been really interesting to see what would have happened. But um, so get into college and um, you know away from home for the, for the first time and oh boy, let's go party. Um, Oh, especially Davis, dude. Get out of town with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, there's uh, apparently a little fun fact, I guess. Uh, you can be expelled from school for going out cow tipping. A uh, little huh, okay. something I, I picked up along the way. So anyway, uh, so I, I... have an orientation. Right? Yeah, screw it. Um, so I actually got my start into fermentation uh, when I was 18. Okay. And... Uh, Fast forward a couple years. Uh, well, actually, and, and just another little thing, uh, a couple of buddies, uh, mine and I uh, would, instead of going out to all the fraternity parties, uh, buddy had his brother's ID. We'd go across the street, get a couple bottles of wine, a baguette and some cheese. And instead of raising hell and causing trouble, we would just sit back and, and you know, I, I kind of hate to use the term, it sounds cliche, but be intellectuals. Oh yeah, be continental, smoke cigarettes, and talk about uh, you know yeah. talk about Faust and uh, you know <laughs> German cinema from the nineteen twenties. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what it was. 
<laughs> so you fast forward a couple years and um, I uh, actually had listened to a podcast and I heard something about mead and I thought, well, this is interesting. Let me, let me see how this thing goes. So I, mm-hmm. I started making mead and I got really frustrated because, uh, you know, six months to a year before your product's ready to drink. So oh, yeah. I started looking for different ways to, uh, to get my imbibing on and mm-hmm. found beer and uh, the very first batch of beer I brewed was this uh, kit from a place in uh, Laguna Niguel. It's O'Shea's or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, shout yeah, out, yeah, shout yeah. out to those guys. Um, it was an Old Castle brown ale. And um, I had already I purchased... It. I get Palmer's, it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Palmer's uh, How to Brew book. And it was, I don't know, the third um, printing or something like that. Oh, wow, you baby. Wow. wow. Look yeah. how young you are with a third edition. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Palmer. Yeah. The guy knows his stuff. His his latest one is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the amount of information he had, the amount of work he put into it was, was absolutely uh, stunning from that standpoint. But um, so I, I leafed through the book and it was kind of like uh, going through a textbook. It's just all this information that you have no grounding for. You don't have any tangible experience to apply it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'd read through it and just, yeah, okay. Grabbed the, uh, this kit and it had half a sheet of paper. It was uh, what, um, eight by five. Okay. Uh, and it had all of the instructions on how to make a batch of beer. So I, I read this thing over probably 15 times. Like, did I miss anything? You know, there, I don't know. There's what, 40 words on the thing. Yeah. And I, I make this batch of beer and it comes out. It's just oxidized. I drink the whole five gallon batch, but it was pretty disgusting. I sit down to open up Palmer's book again and I start reading it. And the first thing he says in there is take the instructions and throw them away. So um, word to the wise. Um, throw away those instructions from the beer kit on your first run. Uh, and then after that, I just got hooked and, um, I don't know, man. Uh, are you thirsty? I'm thirsty. Oh yeah. I'm drinking, I'm drinking the blonde ale right now. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah. I am actually, since my taps are back the way, I'm going to go get a beer. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Right in the middle of the show, Chad, really? Like you've never heard the show before? You're just going to go leave. So I'm going to talk and, uh, you know, we're not going to wait for the break. I'm watching Chad and I'm just stuck watching Chad for a beer. Wow. How dare you? How dare you abandon me in my I'm time just of keep, need? keeping you on your toes. You know, <laughs> sure that you, uh... <laughs> well, look, tomorrow I have to sit here and listen to this and then edit this. Now I'm sitting here. All I'm doing is figuring out how to what I do anyway. Um, Sandy Blondale, Sandy with an I. What's this beer about? Please tell me about it right now. Sandy with an I is my mother-in-law. And nice. uh, she uh, actually enjoys this beer quite a bit. And uh, I, initially, when I first uh, released this beer here at the brewery, uh, she says, well, why do you spell it with a Y? I spell my name with an I. I said, okay, done. She just kind of looked at me and says, that simple? I said, yep, that's simple. <laughs> <laughs> talking to the right guy. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As it turns out, I make these decisions. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about this beer is um, I use 80% two row on this beer. We're going to kick out a little bit and uh, 20% Munich malt. Okay. And uh, just, just enough hops to balance it out so that it's not, uh, not super sweet, not too much that it's bitter, uh, nice and balanced. And uh, it's, it's definitely one of my top selling beers. Oh, nice. A- absolutely. Cause you don't really find a, a blonde ale too much you know, in that sort of like top ranking because everybody wants, uh, you know, I don't know, something different. <laughs> IPAs. Yeah. Well, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking yeah, like, yeah. you know, like an, like a more like a drinker, uh, but Blondales, you know, it's, it's hard, man. Someone said once, I forget who it was on the show years and years ago, where it's like, if you, if you call a name, a color, it's not going to, nobody wants it like a red ale, a brown ale, a blonde ale. Nobody really wants a blonde ale, but if you call it a session pale ale or a pale ale at that point, whatever, um, you know, it'll do much better. So yeah. it's interesting to like find that this is a, you know, one of your top sellers. Yeah, I'd say top five. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, a little bit darker. Um, yeah, so you, Munich malt there. Yeah, so you just Munich and two row, and that's it. Yep, yep. And my thing is, I, before the brewery, I had never brewed a blonde. I had had several from other home brewers, and to me. It never impressed me. Uh, most blondes, and I, I know we'll give a shout out to Firestone Walker. Their 805 is one of you, the best. You have to. It's in, it's, in, in the world. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not really malty. It's not really hoppy. It just is kind of a carrier of alcohol. It, it, I, I just never found uh, motivation to, to brew one. Um, 
here at Grey Wolf, though, it was kind of my calibration. As I mentioned, I'd never brewed commercially before. So um, after I installed all the equipment, which I, uh, again, did all myself, um, had to, you know, did a water batch all the way through the whole process, make sure all the pumps work and I've got all the fittings and everything and tied in correctly. Um, yeah figured okay let's go live and I, I brewed this blonde wrote it on the spot and said well uh if if it sucks it's going to be the cheapest way for me to get into this and still have to dump it okay fine uh turned out pretty good and again it's been one of my top selling beers so i feel like with been. beer it's a lot like making bread uh i make a lot of bread at home <laughs> thanks to the pandemic but even before but anyway it's right. like it's like it's still or like making pizzas right where it's still going to be pizza dough it's still going to be bread it might not be the best bread you ever had. And I feel like it's the sort of the same way with with homebrew or with with beer, or I should say, because homebrew is a different animal. But like with a recipe that simple, unless there's a contamination issue, it's still going to be beer. And I don't I, I couldn't see how, you know, your first batch is really going to suck. I mean, maybe your your gravity will be off two points. You're trying to shoot for five and you get seven. You're like, OK, I can I can add water back or I can make it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is sort of like a lot of margin for error. Um, and I think that's a good recipe to start with too, because you, you know, you can float it up or down if you needed to. Right. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So uh, I just, I really like to eliminate all major variables. Uh, always. That's just the, my, my mantra in general. Um, you do as much research as you can before you get into the whole thing. And then you just lean on your experiences to make it work after that and just keep on chugging. And um the, uh, the I, as always is the case with with home brewers, uh, I, it's been repeated over and over again. The three most important rules in, in home brewing are sanitation and sanitation and sanitation. Right. So yeah. uh, that was that's just the uh, the process that I, I utilize here and and keep uh, keep in mind all the time. And uh, yep, yeah, uh, again, we just. Uh, we keep working on uh, each of the recipes. Uh, each batch just seems to get a little bit better. Uh, you know, okay, and, good. Yep, yeah, and uh, documentation is another one of my things. I'm, I'm really big on keeping track of what it is I do each batch. Sure. Um, what, what temperature actually was hit? What pH was, you know, what did you get? Um, so uh, that, that allows you to put together all the different batches and, and look at your notes and figure out, hey, this has happened the last time. Here's where we go going going forward. Hey, you know what? Maybe we need to change this a little more gypsum this time or whatnot. Okay. And those are the small tweaks you're making on this, but it's basically still 80, 20 to row yeah. music. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, uh, that just works out because it's a uh, one sack of, um, one sack of Munich malt and four sacks of, um, oh, yeah. the two row. So it's, Easy. it's real simple. Uh, yeah. five, five barrel batch, uh, my efficiency is running somewhere around 72 to 75%. Um, not exceptional, but, uh, it's consistent. So. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's one of the homebrew things too, where you're like, you know, you can either sit and tweak it out. I think Palmer said this, I me mean, was Jamil, where it's like, you know, you can sit and fuss over a 5%, you know, uh, efficiency, or you can add a pound of grain, which is a dollar 10. Yeah. And then there you yeah. go. And that's all you got to do. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. whatever. It's at, at some point we're just, you know, we're wasting potential sugars. It's not, <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, at, at the homebrew level, at, at the commercial right. level, that starts to it's make a, little a difference. Bit different. and, sure. Yeah. You, you need to, uh, you need to make sure that's all um, accounted for and, and straightforward. So how, how do you adjust your efficiency on the commercial level? I still haven't quite figured that one out yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, I I had planned on having twice as many brews last year as I ended up getting in uh, mm -hmm. with the the pandemic and everything else. My sales literally were a little more than a hundred thousand dollars below projections. So mm -hmm. I, I there was just a lot of brewing I didn't do, yeah. and uh, somewhat to a detriment, I guess. I have sixteen taps. And uh, right now I have four loggers on. I've got a couple different ales. Uh, my, my two flagships really are my, my West Coast IPA and my Belgian style triple. Uh, and uh, keeping up with all of these, these different beers that I've got, uh, there's several customers various customers that love each one of the beers. It makes it really difficult to remove a beer when you want to bring something new in because you're uh, going to piss somebody off. 
Sure, but you know, yeah. It, what are you gonna do? Uh, you, you mentioned uh, blonde ales, brown ales, red ales. Yeah. Um, the second brew I did on this system was uh, was a brown, and. Uh, people enjoyed my brown uh, in my business plan. Actually, the brown was going to be one of my flagship, one of my top four beers, one of the core fours. And it turned out that everybody enjoyed it. They all thought it was good, but nobody bought it. That's Except, you've spoken yeah. like a true homebrew or this is my business plan to make a brown ale one of my core beers. No, <laughs> it's not yeah. uh -uh. good yeah. luck. Uh, definitely something else I've learned. I love ESBs. Uh, when I go out to places, if they've got a beer engine, I automatically ask for whatever they have on pouring on that beer engine. I want yeah. Cascale, bring that to me. Um, nobody cares. Nobody can, nobody gives a shit. No. Nope. Um, nope. Let me take a break because I'm out of this beer. Uh, I'm going to go get another beer. I don't know what yet. What should I get next of the beers that you sent? <sighs> um, let's go with the, the Schwartz beer. Schwartz beer. Okay. Next. Uh, and then we'll get into uh, a little bit of that and uh, a little bit more about brewing and, uh, you know, trans uh, transferring from a home brewer to a craft brewer and, uh, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. Hang on, everybody. Gray Wolf Brewing on the session. We'll be right back. Thanks for hanging around, everybody. We still got Chad with Gray Wolf Brewing in Norco, California. And uh, I'm surprised your tagline isn't Norco. You'll get addicted. That's my that's my Norco joke. Um, we're doing a Schwartz beer, uh, Schwartz Wolf. Yes, Tell sir. Me about uh, your Schwartz beer here, man. While I open this up. Yeah, years ago I I went to this uh, this German deli and had a um, had a brat, and I thought this was kind of interesting. I want to say it was Kostritzer, if that pronunciation's oh. yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, no one will know. But uh, it was actually on draft, and I'd only ever had it in a bottle, and it was absolutely like mind blowing. Just kind of one of those moments. Where, where did you go? But just um, out of curiosity, it was a uh, uh, old world down in Huntington Beach. Oh, okay, uh, place called Rat Skeller, uh, which apparently is no longer there. Okay, unfortunately, but uh, I only know one of like German deli slash craft beer spot in, uh, <laughs> in like in Soka. I think it's. I'll say Hollingshead, but I don't Hollings know. Hollingshead. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah that, they, place uh, tough, dude. that place is absolutely bitching. I, yeah, yeah I, I've spent a lot of time there. Yeah. Got a lot of friends that go there too. Uh, but anyway, so uh, yeah, I, after that experience, it, it just stuck with me. And then uh, once I, I got my, my, my brewing feet underneath me, if you will, as a home brewer, I, I it might have been one of the first loggers I ever brewed as a home brewer. It's, figured you know what the hell let's let's give this a shot yeah. and I, I i back then i started to really develop my my focus on uh my 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 thought process to writing recipes and the, the generally the way i start this all off is i i do research into how the beer has been brewed before specifically if it's a, a beer as old as many of these german styles and this sort of thing yeah mm. And uh, I figured, you know, what better place to start than those who uh, have been brewing this beer for, call it centuries, and uh, didn't have all the technology we have now and were able to figure it out. So uh, that was the place I started uh, and um, went from there. And then uh, over the years, uh, brewed it one or two more times. And I knew that was something I wanted to bring in here at, at Grey Wolf and um, got to just use the uh, the Schwartz Wolf, which uh, if nobody's familiar with the, uh, the German translation, it just translates literally to Black Wolf. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's one of my personal favorites and uh, many of my regulars. This is actually the second batch here uh, I've brewed here in the past year. So it uh, it's probably gonna be uh, a staple for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah and it's 5.7, is that? Is that high for the style or I don't? Yeah, it is. Um, are you, and, a, are you a high alcohol style guy? Not always. Okay. Uh, I brew really good high alcohol beers as it mm -hmm. turns out, but, uh, this one actually was, uh, <laughs> was known. The, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Alcohol makes up for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, with this one specifically uh, on brew day, and even when I ordered the ingredients for it, I crossed up two recipes in my brain and didn't actually look and confirm the number of sacks of grain I needed. Okay. So for this specific beer, I ordered and included on brew day an additional sack of Vienna malt. 
Ah, uh, which all right. Normally, I don't use Vienna malt in this beer. It's normally Munich, uh, Pilsner malt, and then um, a little bit of uh, crystal malt okay. and um, and a little bit of roasted barley, which I I don't remember where I read about it as a home brewer. It might have been a Palmer thing, maybe a Jamil thing, where instead of adding the uh, roasted uh, malts to the mash, you add it at uh, Vorloff. Mm -hmm. towards yep. the end at uh when you're when you're doing your fly sparge so you don't get the same uh ph drop from all the roasted malts in there uh, so anyway yeah uh it's five seven because there's an additional sack of grain in there that was not <laughs> planned for well so are you going to keep it that way what do you think oh man uh a lot of people have really enjoyed it this way uh it it adds a, a little fuller of a mouthfeel uh, it does, to it, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Normally, most most uh, Schwartz beers have a fairly dry, crisp sort of uh, mouthfeel and, and finish. This one is a little bit more lasting and, and mm. heavy on the palate. Uh, but I have many of my my regulars and and actually a lot of other people that uh, uh, the the ubiquitous. Uh, I don't like dark beers. Uh, customers that oh, come sure. in and, and it's like, all right, you know, will you, you humor, humor me and, and just have a little sample of it? Uh, yeah, you, you, you throw it at them and they, they not figuratively throw it at them. <laughs> and they go, I love being <laughs> assaulted at this new business. It's this so is much fantastic. Fun. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah. they, they take a sip and you could just actually see their brain trying to do mental gymnastics, trying to figure out like, wait a minute, I, this is good. Uh, my, uh, I'm not supposed to like dark beers. Yeah. I don't like dark beers. And and of course, then that just opens the door. And it's, you know, all of us in craft beer know dark is a color, not a flavor. Right. And that, that of course, elicits laughs and it just breaks the ice and everybody has a good time. And um, that's something I really try to do here at the, the brewery. It's just uh, have fun. Brotherhood. Uh, yeah. Having fun and, and people just make it stick. So anyway, um, yeah. Uh, I love this beer. People have uh, responded really well to it, and um, I'd have to look at the numbers. It's probably, uh, probably top eight, something along those lines. Okay. Pack really. Um, I mean, that's which, that's not too bad considering you know it, it because you're right. A lot of people don't drink darker beers. It doesn't matter if it's a Schwartz beer or a porter or a or whatever. Like they're just not really. You know, people no. are really shifting to these these easy drinking, refreshing. Uh, even if it's a pale ale or an IPA, it's like, it's, you, but, you know, because dark beers sort of just hang around a little bit. And that's, you know, what yeah, our, the, our, the crisp, uh, our, yeah, our big galaxy crisp, brain, homebrew brains like is we like that malt flavor. Mm -hmm. We like to hang around, but 99% of the, in, in th those of us in the craft brewing world, yes, the right. consumer, uh, consumer well, does the not lactose think fruited yeah. sour IPAs just big, I, I don't know. I never say never on anything. This is this is something else. I know it, it's a point of contention a little bit. I've got some friends that that criticize me for certain things that I do. I have two seltzers on here at the brewery, uh, but also it, I'm a brewer. I look at it as a challenge because making seltzers taste good is is actually Tough. somewhat challenging. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is uh, I'm also uh, owner of a business, so you know you you want to offer something to anybody and everybody that comes in. So back around. Loggers. <laughs> I, I, I really hope loggers become the new thing, like the next Thanks. fad. I would yeah. absolutely love to see that. I'm, I'm well, maybe placing myself in a position to really be one of the top players in that if that comes about. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think we need more loggers in our lives. I agree. I agree. And, um, you know, it is coming around like the last few, the last few guests have all sent loggers for the most part, um, which is rare. You know, and uh, and so it's it's good to it's good to see that people are trying to, 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 you know, come back to easy drinking beers because it is sort of like the classic. I mean, hazy IPA, I think, is like an easy drinking beer for people who like those disgusting flavors. And <laughs> for loggers, for the rest of us, for human beings with elevated palates, I feel like a nice lager, be it a Hellas or a German Pills or whatever, um, you can still you. That's what uh, it's an easy drinking lighter beer yep. that you can still enjoy, and and there's no reason not to do it. So, what's your lager process on this guy? On the um, 
Yeah, so uh, obviously we, we discussed the, the mashing process. Um, mm -hmm. Being that it is Pilsner malts, um, I utilize a 90 minute boil, whether that's actually required or not. Uh, there's been a bit of research here recently that uh, alludes or, or says that uh, that's not exactly necessary. Um, hmm, I, I'm not really willing to take that chance, you know, for an extra half hour boil. It's it, no big deal. I, I don't mind at all. Uh, but I actually uh, take a page from uh, Tasty's quick lager uh, method that uh, he uh, he touted for a number of years at restaurant oh. space. Tasty. Yeah, for uh, sure. For yeah. sure. But uh, yeah, so, I never. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. about it. We'll talk. Right. So, like I said, it's it's kind of a pseudo version of what he talked about. Okay. I, I I generally pitch 50, 52 degrees. So I, I start things off fairly cold. Well, mm, that's not entirely true. Um, I will pitch at about 60 degrees, but set the glycol on my tank to 52. So the yeast go in and it starts the lag phase at a warmer temperature, but as it comes up and goes through its aerobic um uh, anabolic or, or uh, consumption, whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, the uh, the aerobic phase where it's consuming oxygen and making the sterols for cell wall and all that good stuff. Uh, it, it the temperature starts coming down before you shock the yeast, and uh, once yeast goes into that anaerobic phase, once you actually see physical fermentation happening and CO two off gassing, temperature changes have a far greater impact on uh, the the fermentation profile and, and the yeast activity. Whereas at that earlier stage, uh, it's more kind of par for the course. You're pitching a little bit warmer, the yeast are a little bit more active, you get a stronger start to your fermentation and things get moving on. Uh, this is all anecdotal evidence. I don't have any data to prove that this is the case. Well, other than just experience and, and seeing yeah, it happen. Yeah, it happens to you and that's all that matters. You know, yep. can, you, you can read it in textbook, but if you don't re, uh, re replicate those results or get those results, it doesn't, then it's, it, it might as well be incorrect information. Right. And then uh, from there at about 50% attenuation, I start ramping up the temperature. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, again, it's at, at lager temperatures, 50, 52 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I start to uh, about every 24 hours increase uh, temperature on the glycol controller by two degrees per day, plus or minus. Uh, and by the time it finishes, we're, mm, I don't know, uh, 12 to, well, 14 to 18 days probably uh, to finish off fermentation. And at that point, uh, I, I finish around 68 degrees or so, 65, somewhere around there. And I've already done my de-rest, so I don't have to worry about any of the diacetyl or any of that bad stuff because I'm already there. Yeah. And then at that point, um, uh, oh, something else I do at about uh, 10 or 15% left in attenuation, I close off the blow off and more or less let it um, uh, sponge or uh, carbonate on its own. Uh, it does a couple things. One, I don't have to buy as much CO2. Yeah, and, right. and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not off gassing a, a product that is actually usable. Uh, thus far, it seems like it actually produces a better product. Uh, and this kind of throws back to, uh, as I said, one of my flagships is the my Belgian triple, which uh, as a home brewer was um, bottle conditioned only. Um, I, I didn't keg it at all. It just didn't turn out quite right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just a, the way that bottle conditioning works. And I, I don't know if it's actually true or not, but people talk about a finer bubble inside the beer. Uh, might have to, uh, hit yeah, up, uh, I, I remember hearing on that, that. Yeah. I remember hearing that too. I'm like, there's, it's, there's no way that, I mean, you can, I just don't, I don't buy it that it's a finer bubble. I think that was back from like a Papazian thing. It, it, yeah. I don't know. He's that carries over. I, I can't, because I, I, how do you measure that? You know, I, I have like, no idea. You know, one thing that you can do, though, is you can tell a story and people will go, oh, oh, that's interesting. OK, well, take, for example, the story of IPA or the, the general uh, assumed story that IPA was developed to send beer down to India from mm -hmm. England, yeah. which uh, Mitch Steele in his book and in his research said that, well, no, that's actually not the case because people were actually making pale hoppy beers in England for a hundred years before they started shipping stuff down to India. So mm -hmm. I like, I like to bust myths on stuff like that and, and all that. So, uh, yeah, lager method. Um, and then, um, I 
honestly, in, in my loggers, I don't use any type of fining, any biofine or gelatin or anything else. Uh, just yeah. cold age it for a couple of weeks, uh, maybe four weeks or so, and then package and, um, Okay, so I mean, you're still talking what a six week turnaround time, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Roughly. That's not anywhere, you know, and you know the 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 all that information that Tasty picked up from just talking to brewers and stuff where they they were trying these things. I I never really had a good one. I will say, water. and and so I think I think <laughs> the way you're doing it is a little it, you're 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 rushing it in the right places because that yeah. that first 24 48 hours is important mm -hmm. and you can get that yeast going but you don't overdrive a lot of garbage and i think it's if you did it any higher of temperatures i think you would get this to me this didn't taste like a quick lager and nine times out of ten on this stupid show i i would i would pick them out i'm like no there's mm -hmm. it, it's not rounded enough mm -hmm. but i think i wonder if you're aging it for longer than these other dummies have done so if you're throwing four weeks of age onto it it's still it's going to mellow out versus like oh yeah here's a here's a pilsner i did in two weeks no i don't want i don't want to drink that and you know someone in the chat was like oh well you know loggers mean less fermentation turnarounds yeah it does <laughs> so charge a little more or don't do them uh, but, I yeah. think, but i think i'm, I'm just going to keep interrupting you because i don't care but i think that that this is a a a better representation of a a quote unquote rushed logger method than uh, than I've I've had before and uh, you know it's um it's uh, you know I I think you're I think you're experimenting in all the right places. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, your opinion um, has value to it. Um, as you have, I don't know, seventy thousand followers or something along those lines. Like, I don't know. It, yeah, something like that. Me there's, personally, there's... no, but the Brewing Network, <laughs> all Russian yeah. bots. I don't, you don't, you know, we don't actually have actually humans that follow us on social media. I'll, I'll throw a little shout out for your other podcast. Yes, Ears Up, which I will say I've never actually listened to. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> to tell you, man. So is that not a backhanded comment? I know Justin talks about backhanded comments. Or, or, uh, yeah, well, he projects a lot, so it's fine. Well, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so I, I just I will because I love loggers. I will stick to making them. I will I'll do it all. Uh, just continue to do so. I will say probably my number four, number five selling beer is a Mexican style lager. Uh, I call it Norco Lager just because it's the beer that I envision um, becoming kind of the staple. Where um, I would really like to grow production to the point where. I can make it on a larger scale and be yeah. able to make it much more viable and, and cost effective. Um, I only brew that beer. I, uh, well, just to talk about my system here a little bit, a uh, five barrel brew house. I have two 10 barrel tanks and two five barrel tanks with a five barrel bright tank in my, um, in my business plan. I figured within probably the first two years or so, I was going to replace the five barrel bright with the 10 barrel bright just envisioning, um, you know, tap room sales and growth and all that. Well, you fast forward a couple of weeks <laughs> <laughs> and COVID happens. Uh, it actually would have been a, a far better choice to go at least with a 10 barrel bright or two 10 barrel brights. And then the two fives and the, the two tens to uh, be able to maximize and, and make the loggers the way that I like to make them. Yeah, well, and again, I, you know, I, I sort of go back to like your, you know, and I, obviously it's not it's not a, a an, an insult. I'm just trying to figure it out, like your your lack of commercial brewing experience. Like, what motivated you to just jump right in instead of, oh, yeah. you know, invent uh, in, inventory? What the fuck am I talking about? Uh, interning at a, a right. place or sitting in on a beer or something like that. So to yeah, on, on that note, um, so. Going back to 2016, I was a, a manufacturer's rep for a, a company that made equipment that uh, the military and, and law enforcement bought. I was with that company for almost 10 years. And in 2016, I got laid off. Okay. So at that point, uh, we were actually three months after our first son was born, my wife and I. And oh. it was it was one of those uh, uh I'm not going to say come to Jesus moments where, because that it, uh, just would make you think that somebody else brought this to my attention. It's one of those where it's like, okay, um, this is, could potentially be a midlife crisis. Uh, I, I 
just had my first child and had a decent job that just disappeared. Uh, so God bless my wife for putting up with me for all these years. Uh, we've been married now four years. Um, we got married after our, our first son was born. Uh, we've, we've <laughs> for those together. of you doing math at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've been together for 12 years. So, I mean, it yeah. wasn't just a, it wasn't like, oh, oops. I mean, yeah, you didn't meet her down at the bar, down at the roadhouse or whatever. Right, 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 right. I mean, maybe so, you did. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was not that case. <laughs> uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so we've got a three month old and I'm out of a job. Um, she had a solid income that is pretty stable. She, uh, she's, a, she's a teacher. So we, we okay, you know what? Uh, and, and the other thing that I, I recommend to everybody is reduce your debt. Get rid of debt. At, mm -hmm. And I almost may just sound like Dave Ramsey, but at whatever. Um, get rid of your debt. Just, just make it disappear. Uh, figure out how to do that so you can live your life on your terms. And this is proof. So we did that. Uh, I get laid off. And then my wife says, all right, well, you've been talking about wanting to open a brewery. Um, you've won a lot of awards for your beers. If, if you're ever going to do it, now's the time. So basically, she was the one kicking me in the ass to, to put it all together. And uh, she was also the one that said, you need to convince me with your business plan if, if I'm going to go along with it. So um, yeah, okay. you fast, fast forward. Um, couple of years and uh, it's it's almost go time. I uh, I had actively been looking for a place to land Grey Wolf for, oh, I don't know, 12, 13 months or something like that. It was getting a bit discouraging. Uh, I, I knew I wanted to start small. And in this market here in Southern California in 2019, uh, spaces in the 1600 to 2000 square foot range mm -hmm. uh, would, would show up on the market and disappear in, in a day or two. Oh God. It, it, everybody was leasing just, it, it, they just, it just did not exist. So uh, I had a, a real estate agent uh, through a network and this is something else, build a network, talk to other people. Uh, it's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know. So uh, I, I may interject all these little bits of wisdom I've gained over the years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> like, let's go, Chad. Come on. I may, I may sound like an infomercial before this is all over. Hey, man. Look, if you start marketing a uh, chop and slap or whatever, slap chop and a, <laughs> chop a and sham wow, oh, then we're oh, done. Wait. But oh, yeah. Wait. Sorry. Wrong one. You, you um, yeah. Um, so uh, it, it came down to um, I was sitting on the couch one night uh, and uh, scrolling through Facebook. Uh, and uh, I, I saw a post by the uh, the previous brewer at, at the the location here, and he posted that uh, they were closing their doors and, and moving east. I turned to my wife and said, "Hey, honey, check it out. These guys are leaving." She says, "Oh, that's nice, honey. Have you called the real estate agent yet?" I went, "Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, quite an idea." Called yeah. him up the next morning, and uh, we set up an appointment. And well, yeah, fast forward two years, here we are. Um, it's been absolutely unbelievable. Uh, this this community here in Norco. Um, is for being a business and wanting to be part of the community, they absolutely embrace you. It, it is unbelievable. All things considered throughout the past you know, year and a half, I guess now really, uh, for, for the community to rally around and, and support us. We are currently the only brewery here in the city. And there's a couple to the south of us uh, along that 91 corridor that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll shout out uh, Main Street, Sky, uh, Skyland Storytellers, uh, Evans Brewing is new out here, Wicks Brewing, uh, Stone Church, Route 30, Thompson, wow. all those guys. Literally never uh, heard of a single one of them. And just to, to hear that they're all sort of, you know, the same area. That, I don't know, man. There's so many breweries out uh, that would freak me. And so, again, yeah. you, again, back to my question. This is the third time you've evaded me now. <laughs> Why would you enter a business like this having no commercial experience, especially especially in a, a competitive market as craft beer? Faith. It's about yeah. the only thing I can do, just to give I mean, you an answer. You, you sort of said it when you said you were having a midlife crisis, and I think you sort of touched on the reason why, and I just want yeah. to expand on that a little bit because it, craft beer is very emotional, I think, at the end of the day. If you, you have a lot of passion if you're in this business, you have passion for it. There's a very few people who are in it specifically to, to sell. And I know there's a lot of famous examples 
of people who have started businesses specifically to sell and they did it and that's fine or they marry a b reps whatever that's fine <laughs> we won't talk about whatever bitch. her name was it's fine but <laughs> um for the most part yeah. people are very passionate and very uh into the the scene and and i think that with you it sounds like you this was the you you getting fired for a gross negligence no i don't know um <laughs> absolutely not. Lo losing your job is sort of like <laughs> well like what like when i left more beer i was like shit i got i, I want to do something i got to do something now i don't care what it is and then Let's you met experience. justin and what the hell happened Oh no, I was I was doing these shows way before. Oh, yeah. no, but yeah, like yeah, more yeah, yeah. I was there for like 15 years. I'm like I got to do something else. I don't know what it is. Um, so but, so but you, yeah, you for those, for me, you those moments in life to sort of kick your own ass and be like, I right, fuck it, I got to do it. Either I'm gonna pass or fail, no matter what. I knew that I wanted to become a business owner. I knew that it was a, a challenge that I would rise to. I just didn't know what the hell I would be passionate about. And and I somewhat listening to some of the naysayers in my family, uh, you know, well, why would you want to do that? Um, and people in the community that say, oh, you know, why would you want to do that? You'll never make it. Uh, and I, I just finally said, you know what? Um, screw all that. I love beer. I get into conversations with people about beer. I've done ridiculous amounts of research about this stuff. I know it top and bottom. Um, I, I never went to school for any of any of the beer stuff. It was just all self-taught. Yeah. Um, the interwebs helped out, you know, immensely on that. So uh, I said, you know what? Uh, and, and again, God bless my wife for <laughs> yeah. somebody that had never <laughs> had any business experience or had never uh, brewed commercially before to, uh, take this plunge. And, uh, on that note, we're also self-funded. We don't, we did not take on any investors. We did not, um, uh, do any, uh, take on any assistance in that form. Uh, I did take on some business loans uh, and, and sure. made, uh, which kind of puckers you a little bit when you, you know, make personal guarantees for oh, six yeah. digits when, sure. uh, you know, <laughs> when, and then the pandemic hit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's scary as hell yeah sure, um, and you're thinking wow did i just uh, throw away the potential for my my children to you know go to college if they want to you're like like what the hell do you do are we going to be living on the street like what the hell um but uh, no things have things have been uh, really uh, really good for us and uh on that note in in 2021 here we actually are matching our uh, what i thought initially were some optimistic numbers on my business plan we're mm -hmm. actually matching those numbers um oh, thus wow. far this year you know i've heard a lot about that from other people too where it's this this year has sort of been like their best few months so far because of everyone just sort of rushing back to normalcy or supporting the the local economy or both you know what i mean it's like maybe people are over buying uh, yeah. and maybe there'll be a course correction or maybe people will miss this so much that they are aware that these places can go away at any time i don't know how it is in, in other states but uh certainly here in california one of the things that uh, as a, a a beer manufacturer uh the abc offered up a um offered up, uh, created what they call a catering exemption. And the, the business owner could uh, apply for a expanded quote tasting room. Uh, what it does is it, it uh, allows you to utilize your parking lot basically as your tasting room. So for the idea of safety and, and keeping people separate and all that during, during COVID, uh, and in my case, it actually expanded my tasting room quite a bit, uh, putting people outdoors, uh, Thankfully, uh, I am able to uh, utilize that space to the level I am. The landlord, again, is a, a craft beer fan, so that helped a lot. Nice. And uh, in the, the building I'm in, I think there's like eight different units in this building. Um, basically, none of the other tenants are here on a Saturday. So I can utilize the entire parking lot and oh. bring in a lot more people. Uh, and uh, just a, a little seg or segue or, or little aside, a tangent. Uh, I bring in food trucks and everything else and, and fill up the parking lot on Saturdays. And it's, it's actually been really good for business. Um, 
but uh, to address your question from earlier, um, you know, <laughs> how much fun, <laughs> motherfucker? <laughs> how, how exactly do I do this during COVID, and how do you yeah. stay open? And, and did I just say screw the man and and all that? No, I mean, not not really. No, um, I am very cautious with the decisions I make as a business, simply because there was a lot of money that uh, the wife and I invested into this, and and the amount of time I spent away from my family uh, in making this thing uh, what it is today. So I, I wasn't going to say, um, you know, screw it, though. This town is definitely on the conservative side, and many of them are not fond of the policies that are in place. But the last thing I want as business owners for anybody to get sick or get hurt or you know, have serious complications due to a pandemic and a virus, which the virus is real. Yeah. I have some friends that are, are, are real not happy with that, but the virus is real. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Just you saying that, I feel like uh, there's now a, an alert on your Facebook, your local Facebook page, where it's like, Chad thinks this is real. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a very real possibility. No, the virus is real. You know, we, we can maybe debate the, the severity of it. And if 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 you are susceptible to it, it is absolutely severe. It's it's no joke. Yeah. Uh, people have died from this thing. And as a business owner, these are things you have to take into consideration. And then you get some customers that say, oh, screw that, screw the man. I, I hate the guy who said all this stuff. And it's like, look, you know what? I don't want anybody to get hurt we are in this thing as a community. This is not like, let's all be smart. Let's take care of each other. This is the message I try to portray. Yeah. Literally, let's take care of each other. I, I, and I would say the majority of people in this industry in, in beer truly feel this way. Let's take care of each other. Together, we are better as a whole. And, and humanity, absolutely. We, you know, this, this whole hatred of others and all, it, it's, it's gotta stop. So bringing all this back around, um, being flexible is exceptionally important when it comes to your business plan and uh, your focus and, and, and business. Finding that, that happy medium between profitability, concern for others, and making, especially if you're in the craft world, whether it's you know, craft bread, craft coffee, craft beer, wine, whatever. Pour your love into it. Do what you love to do. Find it. Do it. And make it profitable. Are you going to cry? Profits are not always evil. Profits at the exclusion of humanity is definitely evil. But, oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But none of us, yeah, I mean, the part of the, the whole, uh, it says my internet connection is unstable. That's no, you're fine. It'll be all right. Uh, no. Uh, all right, finish your thought. Let's talk you about know, this Berliner Weiss. Yeah, I don't know. You're fine. It, it'll just it'll just be... Damn it! I got on a tangent. What the hell was I talking about? I don't know. Being loved. <laughs> loved by yes, someone. Yes. Yeah. You, you love Hugging. your neighbor. Be good to each other. Take care of yourself. Don't expect somebody else to do it. Help each other out. Yeah. That's pretty much it, man. Help each other out. Drink a beer. Have a good time. Have fun. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, look, we can hate people all day long, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't get you anywhere. And, uh, you know, that's why, uh, why I stopped going on Facebook. Cause there's too much, <laughs> that's, there's too much that's of it and it fucking amplifies it. And, you know, yeah, I love reading these articles about Facebook and Twitter and like the algorithms that sort of promote and YouTube that promote these anti-vax things, or just a lot of stuff that like is counter to what people, you know, believe and it see it just all it does is it, it drives profits for these companies but it drives a wedge and it sort of is easy to manipulate some people in the um, in the communities who then go out and say well this is a fact because i saw it on this youtube channel and then someone facts checks the youtube channel and then it's taken down and it's like well they won't they don't want you to hear this and it's like okay and then it's right. just it's more of that conspiratorial thing and it's like if we just weren't there in the beginning to begin with if we just use Facebook to share pictures instead of news articles, we would be we'd be a happier happier place in this world. Um, all right, Bloodberry Berliner. Tell me about this yep. uh, extraordinarily yep. sour, uh, <laughs> you know, yes, change indeed. cleaner or whatever. Uh, this so is like uh, this, this will clean your pennies in a fucking second. Yeah, uh, this beer here was um, I used. Uh, 
the uh, the sour VCA yeast on this one. What's that? Who's that from? Uh, did I lose you? You froze up on me. Nope. I'm here, baby. I will never freeze. I'm always unfrozen. Am I talking to myself? You still oh. there? Yeah. Your internet sucks. Oh, internet connections. Okay. <laughs> Good. You won't lose me. No. <laughs> You'll never give up on me. Yeah, no. Yeah. I'll be here always. I'm hardwired, Why is baby. My bandwidth low. That's that's retarded. I don't know. It's someone in <laughs> so, the. So yes, uh, it's our VCA. It's it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Go ahead. Yep. Um, so it's it's a souring yeast, uh, and I had never used it before. Who made so it? I, I made a, a basic uh, Lalamond is okay. the uh, the yeast uh, lab on that one. Okay. Um, I um, made a basic Berliner. Um, the beer is three and a half percent. So I, I don't know, it was three sacks of Pilsner and a sack of wheat malt or something like that. And a bucket of uh, rice holes because they're cheap and stuck sparges suck. Yeah. And um, Brude went fine, uh, pitched the sour VCA, came in the next day, thought, yeah, you know, let's let's just check gravity, see how things are going. Uh, check pH and and we'll um, we'll see where things are at because I, eventually I planned on co-pitching just to help things along and maybe not uh, dive the pH so terribly. Uh, okay. So at, tw at 24 hours, um, so wort pre-pitching was uh, let's say five eight nine something like that five point eight. Okay. All right. That's about 20, standard, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty okay. standard for for right. wort. Um, 24 hours later is at 2.9. Wow. Good yeah. gravy, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Vinegar is, is somewhere around that level, I think. Um, and within uh, three or, well, shoot, uh, just over two days. So it was uh, somewhere around 60 hours, something like that. Hmm. Um, fermentation stalled pH had dropped so fast that the, the yeast itself, and this is a five barrel batch with a, a half kilo brick of, of yeast for a, I don't know. Um, is it supposed to drop? Brick. Is it supposed to drop that fast? I feel, or, or are you supposed to co-pitch it, like you said, with an ale yeast to sort of like, you know, mitigate some of that? Because you're not making vinegar, for God's sake. Mm -hmm what exactly you're supposed to do i'm not entirely sure okay uh, this is a, a pretty Wonder new why. product so <laughs> no nobody really knows what you're supposed to do okay uh so anyway uh most of those that i uh, most of the other brewers that i've spoken to have co-pitched because of this scenario um and i just said uh, uh, screw it let's just jump in both feet and let's just do this thing yeah so i feel, I feel a hole burning in my stomach right now it, it's yeah. If it's you, very, <laughs> very, very acidic, but it uh, tastes very good. Like the the flavors are still there, and it's still yeah. a very good flavor. It's a very good beer. Super clean. I feel like you need to. I feel like you need to blend it with like a very light blonde or something like that. This is the fruited version. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I, I have this beer without fruit. That is um, undrinkable. You, uh, Going back to uh, uh, oh shoot, uh, Daffy Duck or something like that, where he goes into the bar and they they makes up that drink for him and it burns a hole through the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the the other one is is kind of like that. Uh, the other beer, a straight Berliner Weiss. Yes, I do call it riding the metro. Uh, few people actually get that reference. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, well, so you got to explain it now, dude. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The band Berlin from the '80s. Yes, they wrote a song called riding oh. the metro okay right and, i know this yeah, I, yeah, okay yeah. i figured it was related to the song but i did it was yeah yeah, yeah yeah who yeah, knows yeah, the yeah. band i figured it was blondie who knows <laughs> fair enough yeah. so so yeah uh this this was my my first foray into the souring i didn't i knew i didn't want to go through the trouble of uh doing a kettle sour uh, mm -hmm. those that i've talked to have some issues and there's not really a way for me to close off the condensate stack on completely on my my brew kettle to keep all air out yeah. and uh, especially in the town that i live in with a lot of livestock and a lot of dirt and dust and everything else i, I yeah. there was a very high chance of me making a uh a lambic style beer which was not what i was looking for i didn't want any of the funk i just wanted sour so i went with this uh, again the lalaman sour vca yeast and my God, did it, it sour fast, uh, to fix the, uh, so, uh, it did stall out on fermentation. Um, okay. it, it went from 1031 to 1020 and stalled out. 
And over the course of the next four days, I, I bubbled CO2 up through the, um, the cone on the bottom, trying to get the, to rouse the yeast, to get it to do something, did absolutely nothing. And um, my brother, Ryan Wicks, down the street here um, from Wicks Brewing, said, hey, why don't you just throw a brick of Voss Kvike at this, this thing? It'll, it's a honey badger. It doesn't care. He was not lying. Uh, within <laughs> within six hours of throwing that brick in, it started fermentation and it finished at ten eleven. Oh, so it, okay. it, it finished off fermentation at um, I think the final pH measurement on the finished beer was two point eight three or something like that. I mean, just wow. phenomenally sour and and deep on that front but <laughs> yeah um i i can't drink much of the beer unless i got a, a full stomach um like you said oh, yeah. it's kind of burning a hole through no, there's you. no way dude so how are people taken to this beer they freaking i'm sorry they fucking love it yeah, <laughs> it's good. yeah uh there's Get there's the people are. that either you like sours or you don't and the, and the people that don't like sours like their friends will actually take a sip and like here try this and, and then you like can see their whole face start to turn inside out it's like a uh a black hole formed up and, and is starting to um, beard them in. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, look, like I said, it tastes good. There's yeah. a lot of good flavors, but it's, it's complete, it's completely too sour. I mean, maybe if you start like putting some like syrups in it, you know, some uh, flavored syrups to like sweeten it, but also, I don't know. I think, I think it's a good yeast. I, but what have we learned about next time? Yeah. Right yeah. Uh, well, yeah. so here's, here's part of the problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and this is, uh, again, I, I, I'm full of tangents, so I'm going to jump off on another one right now. Um, I got a piece of advice before I opened this brewery when I was in the writing stage, that if you name a beer something, you better stick to that recipe, because people are going to fall in love with that beer, they're mm -hmm. going to like it. And if you don't like it, and you change the recipe, you're going to piss off your customers. So I don't know if I'll be able to recreate this beer the exact same way because of the circumstances. I know what happened. I documented it, but I don't know if I can recreate it. I don't know that you should. <laughs> I mean, no <laughs> offense, right? But it is such a powerful beer. And I look that advice and that's the way I thought about, about beer also um, I, I was saying just a, a couple months ago to someone, I was like, I'm, I was shocked to learn that craft brewers adjust their recipes for mm. classic, for staple beers. It happens because ingredients change and whatever, right? But you can also slightly shift things. I think you mm -hmm. can make this beer, have it come out a little bit more malty, but still with the same base flavors and nobody's gonna notice. Just a little less acidic, nobody would really notice. In fact, I think they would think it, it was an improvement. And you're, you're, you're probably correct on that one. When, you, when you're talking the level of acidity on this beer, that, that would, Definitely yeah. softening that up a little bit. The, the the pucker heads would say, "Wow, okay, it's not quite as sour as before." But they'll order three pints instead of just two. <laughs> people order two pints of this. Uh, I have had some God. people that <laughs> will order two and three pints. Uh, right. Yeah, they they come up and say, "Give me another pint of that." And I kind of do the whole eye raise thing, like, "Really? Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, you're, right. you must have uh, iron in your stomach or something. Cause this yeah, is I need to melt these handcuffs. I got to get out of here. <laughs> hey, I do have some of those customers too. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure, man. They're everywhere. Uh, let me take a quick break, Chad. And then we're going to break into, uh, I think we have three beers, but I think we're only going to have time to do two. Okay. Um, right. So we'll talk about whatever beers we're drinking. Anyway, hang on, everybody. It's the session. Gray Wolf Brewing. We'll be right back. Thanks, everybody, for hanging around. It's Chad with Gray Wolf Brewing. And we're about to crack the Hop Wolf, which is a West Coast IPA. But before I do, before I curse you, number one, seven and a half percent. So I'm yep. going to curse you. Um, okay. But I think we should address the elephant in the room. You are uh, you are an ex-listener of the show. You're, I, you're I am a current around. listener. It's kind of well, like, you know, uh, those who are in the Marine Corps, you're never ex, you're just retired. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm a retired listener because I work all the time and I don't no one does podcasts anymore. Yeah. If you don't commute, you're kind of like, eh. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm always here at the brewery. I get here early and I leave very late. So yeah. Anyway, um, I, I, just a shout out at some, somebody we haven't heard from in a long time, uh, Riggs, uh, uh -huh. he's down in San Diego right now doing some awesome things. Um, man, I miss that guy's voice. And, um, <laughs> And just because my wife said I had to mention it, uh, Sugar, Sugar Valley Brewer, wherever he is at, uh -huh. um, and uh, she had a request uh -huh. to hear 
uh, the Dildo Mold song. I don't know where it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Lost those songs. Jay might have them somewhere. I mean, we still play JP's an asshole as our outro music. Outro, right? Yeah. Only yeah. because Justin's it's too busy, true? air oh. quote busy, um, to <laughs> where is he? find a new song. He's just running the bar. Okay. I mean, you know, it's it. So it, you know, people forget that like the Brewing Network and the bar are two very different entities. Mm. The bar pays him. The BN doesn't. So. Right. Um, it's kind of like one of those where he's, I think he's back to sort of full staff now because the bar is finally being able to be open for a As bit. a business so, owner, I completely understand where he's coming from on that one. Right. Like, I, yeah. I, I would still criticize him for not being on the air because I, I agree. can, I'm well, a listener. and Sure. Yeah. 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 Is so, that me backhandedly calling you an asshole? Hmm. I don't know. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so anyway, Justin's fine. Someone in the chat was asking about too. He's everything's okay. I talked to him the other day. Good. All right um he's you know he's he's just look he's just trying to keep the bar going yep, so yep. Uh, i'm here trying to keep the brewing network going <laughs> we're sort of, <laughs> hey, we're sort hey, of like hey. parallel I, roads but not talking to each other because it's like everything's fine whatever yeah yeah and doing a fine job i might add yeah well thanks man um yep, yep. so but, uh yeah so there you go we'll be in guy and i i looked on your website which is a uh, gray wolf brewing.com yes sir and uh there's a picture of you with a hop grenade shirt Yes. Them. Yeah. So that's cool, man. Yep. yep. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I know a lot of, you, you hear a lot of the listeners call in and everybody else saying, yeah, you've had a lot of influence on me. And, and honestly, the, that it, it is a, simply a fact, uh, definitely the, a lot of the information that I've picked up, uh, specifically, Hey, the, the quick lagering technique that, uh, tasty was uh, a spearhead for, um, uh, don't do it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, stop doing it. People stop doing it. You said. No, stop. I'm not telling them to stop doing it. Oh. Nobody do it anymore. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, I'm telling you, or, man. Every every time, Warren and I, in between breaks, we would we would debate whether or not a logger was the quick method or not. And mm, uh, nine okay. times out of ten, we were absolutely correct. You, there is a difference. But okay, right. But we're super tasters. That's what sure. I always say. I'm a super taster. So I'm like. <laughs> I'm not your average chud walking in off the street, you know, yeah. wanting to eat jalapeno popcorn and have a lager. Like nobody, you know what I mean? It just people do that. Anyway, sure. Man. <laughs> so uh, Hop Wolf, um, Wolf, this left go. Yep, left co left coast, west coast. Um, it is loosely influenced by Kelsey McNair from North Park down in San Diego. His uh, multiple award-winning homebrew beer called Hot Foo, which I okay. believe he still makes down there at North Park. I say loosely, uh, 2015 uh, NHC down in San Diego, I sat in on his conference on that one. And uh, a lot of the stuff he does, and in, in, uh, I've had a couple beers now, I, I specifically don't remember exactly what it was, but he, you know, there were people that would walk up to the mic to ask him questions and say, conventional knowledge says you can't do X. And he says, <laughs> okay, taste my beer. Or look at the seven gold medals I have for this beer and tell me I can't do it. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's honestly, and we'll get to it here in a little bit. Uh, I was under similar scrutiny from some of the method, methods I used for the next beer we're going to try, which is my Belgian triple, the, the Warhammer. Um, people have told me that I can't do what I do for that beer. And I just smile and hand them a glass of the beer and say, okay, here, I can't do this. Okay. So anyway, Hop Wolf, um, I utilize, um, I, it, and Kelsey does a, a bunch of hop editions, or at least on his homebrew one he did. There was a, okay. a first ward hop, a 60 minute, there was a 30 minute, a 15, a zero. I mean, kind of along the lines of like uh, what Sam Calgioni's doing at Dogfish Head with, I guess now it's Boston beer, isn't it? Uh, the 60 minute, 90 minute, 120 minute, constantly mm -hmm. adding hops to the beer. Uh, and I, started to adjust my recipe to more of a friendly commercial variant where instead of throwing multiple different additions in you um, which it could be argued does absolutely nothing and just wastes money uh, add the hops at a more uh, applicable point in the brew uh, mm -hmm. namely uh, whirlpool and dry hop yeah um, in uh, Scott Janish's book uh, from Sapwood Cellars, uh, that guy 
did an immense amount of research as far as utilizing hops and everything else. You've probably never read it. I know you don't like hops, so it's all no. Good. I've never read it, but uh, they did an interview on Bruce Strong with Scott, and I edited that show. So hmm. there's that. Okay, yeah, that's I'm familiar close enough. With the man's name, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, on this beer, um, what I do is um, I, I use some of the old sea hops, uh, Centennial and Columbus. Um, I, you know, I know Cascades like the old original. It's it's what uh, Ken Grossman uses in, in Pale Ale, and and it's mm-hmm. like the old workhorse. I just don't like Cascade. I don't like grapefruit. Sorry. You know, uh, <laughs> my, my, my thing with, with the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, which, of course, I love. I, it's the consistent beer in my house, that and Coors it's Banquet. A- um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to lie about it. Um, I, I, I think that that's one of those beers where if they change the hops on people, you, you would just obliterate their entire like thing. That's a brewery that's built on that hop. And you can't ever change it. And I, but I feel like it's sort of one of those like nostalgia hops. So I agree with you. It doesn't fit everything. Right. I don't think it also fits the palates of everybody now, the more co- common core beer drinkers. But yeah. you can't with a beer you like Canada Pale Ale. Common you can't. core beer drinkers. What is yeah. a common core beer drinker? In, in, uh, in, in, core <laughs> beer drinkers. Core. Okay. Not common, common core. core. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if Armageddon actually shows up and the apocalypse is here, uh, we'll know that Sierra Nevada changed their hops on Pale Ale. Basically. Be, yeah. Yeah. What happens yeah. there? So, um, and uh, I, I used to, <laughs> this is much of my brewing career is actually stemmed from uh, oops. And um, whether it's uh, not as good of uh, uh record keeping as far as uh, inventory and that sort of thing goes. Mm-hmm. Um, I was making this beer and I the, the first batch I did here at the brewery uh, utilized uh, Citra, Amarillo, Centennial and Columbus hops in the in the as the dry hop. And the, the second time I brewed the beer, uh, my spreadsheet said I had Citra hops on hand. Turns out I did not actually have Citra hops on hand. I uh, either uh, made a, a pilot batch or something I, I, and didn't record the usage, whatever it was. Uh, and it's time for dry hop and I just don't have the hops on hand. So I thought, well, okay, screw it. Uh, we're just going to go with Columbus and Centennial and we're going to double the, the dry hopping amount and we'll see how it goes. Um, the result was an astounding uh, appreciation from all of my customers. No, oh, nice. They they yeah. absolutely loved it. Uh, it's okay. it's super piney, uh, a throwback to older West Coast IPAs. Yeah, it almost tastes. It almost drinks like a double IPA. Yeah, I mean it's it's almost there at seven and a half percent. Yeah, for sure. Pretty close. But it's uh, it's a lot of that caramel coming through, and it's a lot of those that's, older school hops. Uh, do you put corn sugar in here? I not this one. No, that's all malt. Um, it uh, clear. It, yep, I, I must have kicked the keg or something in the in the back because mine is not. Um, it um, I use crystal malt in this. It's uh, for I think 445 pounds of grain or 455 is the the grain bill for a five barrel batch. 15 of those pounds is uh, uh, crystal 45, and um, I, I I think it makes a better beer in this case. Just the yeah. the way it all works together i i know the the big push for a lot of the new age west coast stuff is uh maybe a little bit of uh oh dextrose or dextrin malts um carafoam or or whatever um it's it's funny man like you know listening to you it, it's sort of reminding me of you know all the stories about you know pre-prohibition where there was a brewery on every neighborhood corner or whatever and it's it's almost like you get these regional tastes for beers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't like, I don't know that this beer would work in like out here or in another location or in Oakland or, you know, in like a more, you know, a, a more metropolitan sort of city, mm-hmm. but not that it, not that it's wrong in any way, sure, but sure. that's not what the IPA is out there Today, or not right, what the yeah. IPA is in, uh, you know, Portland or in Cincinnati or whatever. But in Norco for you, this beer works. And it's sort of like a, a testament to open a fucking brewery. If you want to open a brewery, go somewhere and do it. Like the location, it matters, but I wonder if it doesn't matter as much as we think it does. It's not a fucking restaurant. 
You know what I mean? So I think you can, you can serve your local flavors. You can serve your local tastes and still do really well because not everything works for every community. Is that fact? Absolutely. Uh, know your customers. If you're going to be opening a business, absolutely. 100% know your customers. Um, and there were a couple beers that I thought would, would be smashing and well, Brown Owl being one of those and nobody cares. <laughs> so yeah. um, I would and, be like, hell yeah, let's drink uh, some more of this depending, you know, if it's not, you know, 6% or whatever. But, no, my, uh, my Brown was 4.7%. I would have drinking it all day. So, yeah. Okay. It's, and that's, um, I actually got some criticism because, uh, when I first opened all, uh, I opened with 10 beers and all of them were brewed on my pilot system. Mm -hmm. I had only gotten my main, uh, the five barrel brew house commissioned, uh, one week before I opened. So it took me, uh, um, well, two, three months before I even had what, four beers oh, or five beers, uh, yeah. on tap from that. Um, uh, but I, a little bit of a Testament, I think to the overall quality of the beers, not one of them sold out really before the others, all just about all 10 of those beers pretty much sold at the same pace. Okay. So, That's know, good. Uh, there are some places where you go where when they open and they have like four or five beers and then they end up with one and you say, yeah. Oh, I see why this is the last one here because it's, Oh yeah. Like, which That's... is a, a point of contention for me. Okay. Damn it. Do you not uh, brewery owners, brewer, brewers, whatever. Do you not taste the beers before you decide it's good to sell them? Oh yeah. I, I it, it's as a consumer myself it, and you know what I, I'm every beer I make is not going to please everybody. I get that. But damn it, don't sell bad beer. Just don't do it. it it's it, it, it helps yeah. nobody. Um, if you don't know why it's bad beer, figure it out. Um, get to independent tasting panels, check the community, do something. Yeah, life is too short for bad beer. There's there's a there's a lot of people that don't that either can't taste it or don't think it matters. And that's what sort of frustrates me about that fast lager method to be just, you know, not to I'm not and I'm not trying to pick on sure. you personally, but just to think because, you know, we've already established that you do something a little bit different. But it's like, yep. you know, if if you if you are putting out beer that you think that you're cutting corners and you think the customer won't notice, that's when you're doing it wrong. Absolutely. That, that as, as a customer who does notice, I don't appreciate that, number one, because I'm way smarter than everybody else. We've established mm. that. That's a fact. Let's move on. Let's not even talk about it again. I'm smart. Yeah. Years um, and years and years, of course. Yeah, yeah for sure. But it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's also, then, then you're sort of, then you're not bringing the education to the consumer about what a logger is. And I'm just going to pick on loggers. Um, we can even talk about hazy IPA. Peter in the chat's like, is there a shift away from any IPAs or are they going to stick around? Unfortunately, they're going to stick around. But yes, I'm, I'm, without a doubt. I'm sort of glad that they're in their own category. But if, you know, it, at one point when they weren't, it was like, oh, this is an IP, here's an IPA and it's cloudy. And it's like, this is not an IPA. If we want to have to be an IPA, let's make it a different category to not confuse people who are coming into the scene going, Hey, this isn't, this isn't an IPA. Look how fucking clear it is. Like that, it's that kind <laughs> yeah. of shit where with exactly. the quick loggers, it's like, you're doing a quick logger. You're teaching people that these sharper corners are what loggers are all about. Then they no, go no. get a uh, wayfinder Hellas or something. And it's like, what is this creamy smooth law? This isn't a logger. This isn't aggressive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it frustrates me. Uh, you know, as, as uh, an insane person that this yeah. is what I would be frustrated about. Welcome to the asylum. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, yep. I just opened up the uh, Tartarus Warhammer. Yes. Let's talk about really? this. And this will be our last one. Um, and then we'll wrap it up. Yep. Right. Okay. So this literally was my first original recipe. Um, I, after about six months of uh, brewing, and uh, brewing out of kits and everything else uh, and, and brewing with extract, this was uh, really the step into the next realm. I, um, and as has been the case I've alluded to already, uh, on brew day, I didn't have all of the grain that I had initially intended to utilize in the recipe. So uh, as is generally the case with uh, Belgian style triples, um, and I do say triple, I don't say tripel. Trapel. I say double. I don't say Dubel. Um, I, it's just not what I do. Uh, I uh, traditionally the beer is brewed with a Belgian Pilsner malt, 
and uh, they use uh, a candy sugar and uh, some other adjunct malts, uh, wheat or, or whatever. And every place has their own thing. But it was a monastically brewed beer. Mm-hmm. Um, at at uh, there's a lot of the Trappist breweries that uh, just about all of them, I believe, have uh, a version of this this style of beer. Oh yeah. So uh, I was very intrigued by the history behind this beer, and and that probably looking back was one of my biggest uh, drivers to why it, it came to me that I wanted to brew this beer. Uh, I love history. And uh, after I did my initial research, I thought, okay, let's go out and buy some commercial variants. And no. <laughs> Good luck. Without shitting on any of the, the, those, the monks that have been brewing this and, and the recipes that have been out there, it's, it's going to sound that way that I'm shitting on them. So, so be it. Um, none of them really impressed me all that much. Like some were better than others. Some were way too sweet. Some were way too spicy. Some used coriander. Some didn't blah, 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 blah. They, it just, nothing really worked for me. So I said, all right, damn it. I'm going to set out to write a recipe that uh, does work for me. And I, I wrote the recipe. And again, the happenstance on brew day was that uh, I didn't have enough Pilsner malt. So I cut the Pilsner malt with two row and, and ran with it. Um, I use a little bit of Munich malt and some malted wheat in this one as well. What's your uh, yeast on this? Uh, it's White Labs WLP 530. Yep. Keeping yeast, dude. That's I, a- absolute monster and uh i've had people over the years like we were saying earlier uh oh you can't do that with this beer um i about half pitch on it okay all right why is that uh the flavor profile initially it was just because i was cheap and only had one packet of um White Labs, one little, this is back in the day when they still had the little tubes. Vials, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I only had one vial, so I, I just said, ah, screw it, and I just pitched it. And uh, fermentation takes almost four weeks on this one. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not super fast, but uh, starting gravity is 1081. So it's it's 20 Play-Doh. It's, it's a That's pretty big, big beard. Yeah. And it finishes around 1008 at two Play-Doh. So, I mean, it's, it's 9.8%. That's and, good. That yep. does good. I think I remember, I, th- I think it was either Nava Parker or maybe it was even Chris White himself talking about on some of these, you, you can under pitch to drive those esters because the, it stresses the yeast out. And it, and I mean, this, it has a great banana clovey, but not in like a, you know, half of in way. Um, but that, that classic Belgian, that classic Belgian nose to it. And you can smell the alcohol yeah. too. Like you can tell this is a beefy beer just by smelling. Yeah. And the other thing is though, there's no, not, it's not real hot. There's not a lot of no. useful alcohols in this one, no, um, which know. gets a lot of people into trouble because they'll come in and um, as 9.8%, I do serve it in a 13 ounce glass. Oh, um, yeah. Sure. But, well, you're a responsible business owner, <laughs> right? <laughs> I feel yeah. like that's the crossroad between being a business owner and being a home brewer. Whereas a home brewer, you want to just fuck everybody up. But as a business owner, you want to make sure they get home. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, man, uh, this beer is taking care of me. Um, in 2015 and in 2017, it, uh, made it through the first round of NHC and went oh, on to yeah. the finals. Nice. Um, I actually had a judge and I don't know if they're listening or not. I don't know who it was exactly, but they said, uh, if I were to find this beer on the shelf, I would buy it hands down every single time that was in their notes on, on the beer. Uh, if they're, if they rate on untapped, they would, they would give you like, uh, they probably give you a score of 24. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Something right. Yeah. Uh, it, this beer regularly scores 42 to 45 in competitions. So that's like, that's like my oatmeal stout where it doesn't win second Mm. round but it's consistently low forties and people say they enjoy it. it's like, well then just give me a fucking medal and I'll and leave you alone. This is, this is the crossover between competition and commercial. Yeah. And, and I, I, I reiterate this all the time. You can brew beers to win medals and that does not always translate into actually making money and being a successful business. Correct. The, the medals do not pay the rent. No, they help it. They help in marketing. And, and again, I'm, I'm not shitting on uh, the, the BA or uh, GABF or any like, no, they, no, there's absolutely a place and 
trust me, if I got a gold medal, everybody would know about it. I'm not going to keep that secret. But the fact of the matter is that my everyday customers and brewing what they want to drink and what they continuously uh, come in, this is uh, advice for those who are interested in, in becoming uh, brewery owners or brewers, um, brew what your customers want. Yeah, if that's, oh, for sure. I, I absolutely despise pumpkin beers. I love I, them. I can't get I, them. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, not going to do it. No, 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 no. Actually, well, I don't think that they're great. great. I'm interested in them, and I'll buy them if I see them, but I don't miss them when they're gone. But I think they're an interesting style if they're done right. If you I pumpkin, will probably end up brewing one, and on a side note, I will probably end up getting a slushy machine and making such oh, slushies. Bro, because... life, life isn't worth living if you're not a fucking hypocrite. Like, just do it. <laughs> just well, do it. Okay. Again, again, who really cares if you're paying the rent? No, uh, that's cares. not true. That's not entirely true. Well, you know, but but within the context of this conversation, ferment whatever you want and sell it. Like, who cares? Yeah, just please make it taste good. If it doesn't taste good, don't sell it. Yeah, don't, well, and that's the hard, it that's, good. that's the hard line that that's the, or that's the the hard thing about taking a stance. Like <laughs> when monk, uh, when uh, monkish, you know, the classic no IPA thing, and then they suddenly started doing hazies when it when it paid the bills, and you're like. Well, okay, fuck you, first of all, because I really, and then this is the problem with, this is why uh, a lot of craft beer fans, uh, and look, they're great guys. I'm not really disparaging too much, but um, not too this much. is why people get pissed off when like breweries, when craft breweries sell, because you're, you're marketing to evoke emotion out of your customer base. So if you mm -hmm. say no IPAs, dipshits like me go, Hell yeah, dude, you're doing something unique in the space. And I think that's cool. And I support you not because I can get the beer up here or that I particularly was fascinated with it, but I think it's great that you're doing that. Suddenly you're not doing it. Well, that pisses me off and I feel like an idiot because I bought into it. And so it's like, if you're going to pay the bills, then that's cool. Don't take a hard line on shit. But if you're, if you're going to take a hard line, it's hard to, uh, I don't know. It's hard to cross, man. But as a I, business owner, I hate to break your heart, but you're probably a minority. But that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I know. My therapist <laughs> so and I, I talk about that all the time. I'm with you, man. Um, I I love a damn good logger. Uh, and um, uh, on that note, I plant not 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 logger, but ESB was another one that we mentioned at the beginning of the oh, show. Yeah. Um, I have a customer that comes in. Her name's Fran. Every single time she comes in, do you have my ESB yet? I'm like, well, if you get the rest of people in Southern California to start drinking SBs, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, I've got a recipe that a buddy of mine, a home brewer, and I, uh, his name's Leo, uh, we collabed on and um, sent it in to the Pacific Brewers Cup. It took second place. It's a rye ESB. Absolutely awesome. I've already put together the recipe. I've scaled it up uh, to full size. I just hesitate on brewing it here because it'll sit here for a year. Yeah. Nobody, nobody cares. No, Jamil will say that all the time. Uh, you know, he'll be like, yeah, I brew this ESB. Nobody drinks it. I brew it for me. And then when I'm bored with it, I throw it away. But he uses that. I mean, he brews it because he uses that yeast to then, you know, brew something. <laughs> he steps he's up. Like, he... He's like propping it up. But he's like, well, why not brew something that I could potentially sell, but also that I could drink? <laughs> and I'm like, me too. I, I, like, let me know when that shit's in because I will yeah, buy it. Jamil, oh. please. Yes, let us know. Oh, I might make a trip up to... Uh, where's he at? Not Petaluma, Fairfield. is it? No. Fairfield. No, no, no. Fairfield. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, farther south than Petaluma, but it's uh, okay. From you, yeah. it's about uh, seven hours away. <laughs> seven, eight hours. Yeah, something yeah like for that. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No problem. Um, I'm back. All right. Well, look, I like I like the triple. I'm sort of rushing um, because we're we're running out of time. Speaking of rushing, <laughs> um, I did decide to crack open your Russian Imperial Stout. Um, All right. Yeah. Which the, the the weird thing is, it's a seven point five percent. Russian Imperial Stout, which is what your IPA is, and is also less than your Belgian Triple. Right. So I don't know what's going on down what there. What the hell happened there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, I had an efficiency problem that day. That was uh, <laughs> early on in my my brewing uh, career here at at the uh, at Grey Wolf, and um, I had never stuffed 550 pounds worth of grain into my mash tun before. And um, I now know that uh, rushing a sparge and rushing uh, Vorloff and all that stuff uh, leads to um, you leave uh, leave sugar behind. So yeah. I, I want to say I was somewhere around 58 percent efficiency on that beer. Oh, uh, so yeah. I, I left a shit ton of beer behind, but uh, I brought all the flavors across. You um, can do a, a, a next time. Maybe you do a small beer with it. 
Uh, the distinct possibility. Uh, and again, a mile. I, I have no space. Like this, this brewery that the unit I'm in is 1,600 square feet. Um, I, give a shit. I know, I know you don't care. Dig, dig a hole underground. If I can put a fermenter in there. I don't care. Yeah. Because like, I th- like the flavors on here are really good. I think it would make a really good mild. Mild? Mm. Yeah. I mean, you're doing a small beer. I mean, what do you know? Yeah. I don't know shit. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, you listen uh, to this show, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, yeah, that beer is one of those. Uh, I, I believe the recipe is pretty solid. I just need to give it uh, give it the the proper ABV. When I wrote that recipe, it was actually at nine percent, so that would have okay. been more appropriate for a Russian Imperial. I would like to try it when it's when, when you do it right, when you don't screw up. Um, because I, what do you have the rest? You, what's what's your dark grain ratio? Do you know your grain bill offhand? Some people do, some people don't. It's uh, off the top of my head. I, I, I brewed that beer a year ago. Because there um, is there is a, and I'm only bringing this up because I noticed this with my beers, that like older beers with a lot of dark malt get like a, a Kalamata olive, like a Kalamata yeah. olive briny kind of thing to it. And in my experience, right? it's like too much like patent. Okay. So the, um, the acridity of like the patents can sort of mix with the other malt. And I don't know if it's in there, but it's like, it's sort of slightly there for me. And um, I, I would, I would be interested at a higher volume with everything being equal, if that would go away or not. And it's also a year old. So, you know, I think that's that oxidized, <clears throat> you know, sort of like older mm-hmm. aging out. Right. Um, yeah. I'd have to go back and look. I know uh, there was a full sack of uh, rolled, rolled barley in there mm-hmm. so flaked barley in that um the the plan was just to make it max out on mouthfeel and and all of the residuals i want to say it, it finished does. around 10 24 something like that was the uh, and honestly i don't remember what the starting gravity was I think it's one. dark as hell dude yep yep yeah. um no that's a good was... russian pearl stout man and look you know i i like i said i would love to try it <clears throat> when it's uh you, you know, when you do it again, because I, I think you do sort of miss out on some of those flavors. The flavors are maxed out, like you said, but there's something to be said about uh, about getting the alcohol up, too, because that does lend a lot of, you know, sweetness and some, you know, some residual oomph. It, it adds, especially at, at a 9%. Yeah. If you're missing out on 2.5%, you know, like that. Quite a bit. Yeah. That, that would be 1.5% for those who are keeping track. Yeah, but who cares about those people? <laughs> Screw them. Fuck them. Look, I only talk to dipshits like myself, okay? <laughs> hey, so, hey, you know, you know, people ask me all the time, like, why are you talking to yourself? I have an affinity for, like, intelligent conversation, so you can just, like, leave. Yeah. Uh, Peter in the chat says, is the flavor I'm talking about similar to the bell pepper flavor uh, that Lee uh, that Lee Shepard would agree about black patent? Uh, speaking of RIP, shouts out to Lee um, from Dr. Homebrew. Uh you know what, Peter? I don't know. Um, I remember that conversation we we've had uh, before uh, relating the Kalamata olive to the to the bell pepper. I think it's different, but it it might be. I don't know. I, I can get the Ouija board out. We can talk to Lee about it. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry, man. Maybe that was a mean comment to say, but I didn't mean it was mean. I was trying to be funny, and that never works. Uh, well, all right. JP is an asshole. So yeah, well, I'm actually very nice. Uh, Chad, where can we learn more about your beers, man? Uh, Greywolfbrewing.com, uh, my website, and I'm active on Instagram and Facebook. Hell um, yeah. I include Twitter because uh, I don't know why it's there. Um, I hate Twitter. you sort of have to. I don't know. I do appreciate that you have you you have your website on the bottom, and you didn't do the the leading three W's. And so to me, that means that you understand that you don't actually need those. And I appreciate that. <laughs> like, like I, just as like a pseudo uh, marketing guy where it's like, what, get, get the fucking W's out of here, man. I, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Gen X is uh, like ends at uh, 78, 79, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I was born in 78. So yeah, I'm, I'm 43 years old. I'm, I'm the old guy, but I'm the young Gen Xer. Young brewer guy. or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm the old crotchety bastard that actually kind of understands technology. Yeah, same. That's why. That's, that's why. That's the thing. Specifically, why I pointed it out. Because not many people yeah. know, you just get the W's and we're like, <laughs> just it, it's not necessary. No, it's really not. Uh, and, anyway. and really, nobody cares. Yeah. 
Chad, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, good stuff. Awesome. Uh, do I have anything else? I, I wrote some notes here. Um, I hope not because, uh, you know, I got to go. Do, My life doesn't revolve hey, on you. Uh, hey, right. anybody that wants to start a, start a business, start a brewery, just do it. Make sure you're passionate about it. Also, learn spreadsheets. There you go. Spreadsheets do that. Friend. Like, if, if you don't know how, do it. Cause just learn. Honestly, damn it. If Anyway, whatever. Hey, um, <laughs> I, I'm actually a little bit upset. That, <laughs> damn you, JP. Uh, but finish your final thought. Chad gets the uh, final word, and then we're going to end the show uh, before, before we go to Chad. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, support the Brewery Network. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Support your local brewery. Get out there. Wear a mask if you're not vaccinated. Fucking get vaccinated. Don't be stupid. Don't be an idiot. Uh, let's uh, let's kill this thing once and for all. Chad, take it away. Last word. Chad's vaxxed. Just saying. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chad's vaxxed. Chad's vaxxed. You, you do that first person. So, so anyway. You just do that first person. Uh, Chad's that, that, vaxxed. That, that was, for, that, that, that was first person. Yeah, uh, this is going much longer. Hey, everybody, check out greatwolfbrewing.com. Uh, we absolutely love you. We love the community. Uh, come on out. Uh share some community with us. Hey, if you, if you're not local, share community with your neighbors, love them. Don't be an a-hole. I'll just say it. Don't be an asshole. Uh, you know what? <laughs> life is too short for that. Have a beer. It's life. Just again, life is too short for being an asshole. Have so Gray Wolf beer. It's delicious. If you're in Southern California, check us out. Gray Wolf Brewing. We're in Norco. Um, JP's an asshole and Bevo <laughs> is an absolute angel. Thank you.